One of those teachings that seems very important to me that we unearth among many is a teaching collectively known as the honorable harvest. Collectively, this is a canon or principles that govern the exchange of life for life because we are all heterotrophs. None of us here can photosynthesize much as we might want to. <laughs> I want to anyway. <laughs> um, but the honorable f harvest are rules for those human people who cannot photosynthesize. And the rules, as you'll see, are simultaneously biophysical and spiritual. Because in the indigenous way of thinking, matter and spirit are mutually reinforcing, whereas in the scientific worldview, they are mutually exclusive. The honorable harvest is a covenant of reciprocity between human beings and the living world. And these guidelines for the honorable harvest, which I can share in brief here, were really taught to me as a plant harvester. When I would go out to pick berries or go out to pick medicines um, with elders, with wise teachers, this is what they told me. And I think that um, this, these, this canon of the honorable harvest is, is known um, by harvesters all over the world. Um, one of the first things is when you come out to the berry patch or you get to the woods, you never take the first one because it might be the last one. It's an ethic of self-restraint which has inherent conservation value. Different people have different rules about this. Sometimes you don't take it until you've seen four or five or seven, um, but you wait. You restrain yourself. And then if we encounter that next plant, you introduce yourself to the plant. You speak to the plant. You say, Bonjour, Shabadas, Gegish, Kokwena, Dejnakas. Tell them who you are, what you have come for. What is it that you need from those berries or from, for, from those medicines? If you are going to take a life, you need to be personally accountable for that transfer of life. And I know in some places, if you talk to a plant, people would think you were crazy. But in a worldview which honors all beings as persons, we just call it respect. And if you're going to ask the question, you better listen for the answer. And you can listen in different ways. You can look around empirically and judge whether the plants are numerous enough and healthy enough to support your harvest. There are also ineffable ways to listen and find out what they are saying to you. And if the answer is no, it's no, you go home. You go home empty handed because we remember that they do not belong to us. Taking without permission is also known as stealing. And if you are granted permission, the honorable harvest says take only what you need and no more. And this is a very difficult step in our materialist affluence plagued society where the difference between our wants and our needs is blurred and there are those out there to help us blur them, no? Um, we're all encouraged to take everything that we can get. The Honorable Harvest also counsels that we take in such a way that does the least harm and in a way that tries to benefit the growth of the plant. You don't use a shovel if a digging stick will do. And turning back to Omimi, I'm told that our people did eat omimi upon occasion, but with pr particular protocol. And that protocol is that the adults were never taken. Only the young squabs were taken early in the season, right after the first nesting. In that way, the parents would quickly re-nest, replace the young, and the population remained intact. Simon Pokagan again described a profoundly dishonorable harvest where trees were set on fire and all of the nests fell to the ground and laid waste on the earth. The honorable harvest also tells us to use everything that you take. It's just common sense, which we know is not very common. It's disrespectful of a life that you take to waste it. And we have forgotten this easiest lesson to have everything that you need is not to waste what you have. And next, be grateful. Give thanks for everything that you have received. And in an economy that urges us to always want more, the practice of gratitude is truly a radical act. 
Thankfulness for all that is given makes you feel rich beyond measure, where wealth is counted as having enough to share. Gratitude pulls us into relationship with other entities, reminding us that our very existence is in their hands. And gratitude is humbling, an antidote to the arrogance of our time. It reminds us that we are just one member of the democracy of species. It reminds us again, as if we couldn't be reminded often enough, that the earth does not belong to us. My Haudenosaunee neighbors, who you may know as the Iroquois, mark the circle of the seasons with ceremonies of thanksgiving for all the gifts of the earth. And the first ceremony of the year is to the maples, to the leader of the trees, as they come and feed the people in that very hungry time of the year. The second ceremony is for the passenger pigeon. That ceremony continues today. The pigeon dance is done in the longhouse in recognition of the gifts that that bird brought to us. That dance is also done in the longhouse as a reminder of what happens when we forget the covenant of reciprocity, when we forget the honorable harvest. And the next tenet of the honorable harvest is to share with others, human and non, just as the earth has shared with you. So we model that behavior in return. And a culture of sharing is a culture of resilience that can endure these waves of, of plenty and scarcity that come to us. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, to reciprocate the gift. If you take from the earth, in order for balance to occur, you have to go give back. And we've forgotten this. Even our definitions of sustainability, if you look at the definitions of sustainability, they are all about trying to find a formula by which we can keep on taking. And in fact, we say that what our job is as, as human people is not, to, is, is not to ask what more can we take from the earth, but to ask what can we give back in return for the gifts of the earth. And the guidelines of the Honorable Harvest are, of course, extremely timely when the, one of the greatest threats that, to biodiversity and so-called sustainability is overconsumption. And I don't think, honestly, that what we need today is more data, more studies, new technology, or even more money. What is needed is an ethical shift, a change in the story that we tell ourselves about our relationship to the living world. We need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands. We need a restoration of honor, an honor that we can all choose in the daily way that we live. As Gavin said, not ethics that are dropped down on us by on high, or that wonderful way that you said that, but ethics that are made in daily decisions to engage in the honorable harvest. So that when we walk through the world, we don't have to avert our eyes with shame will hold our heads up high and receive the respectful acknowledgement of all of the rest of the beings, and we can look at them in return. And the re reward is not just a good sense of responsibility. It could save our lives. There is another teaching, which is indeed older than the teaching of take only that which you need. And that is take only that which is given to you. And the ethicists among us, I would love to have this conversation because I find this very challenging Ecolo to understand ecologically and ethically. What does it mean for something to be given to us from the lives and the agency of all of these other beings? Can we extend the concept, the honorable harvest, to address environmental dilemmas that we shape today? And I wonder if our energy policy was based on the precept that take only that which is given to us. And I wrestle with this concept. I don't quite understand it. But what I do know is that coal from mountaintop removal is not given to us. That oil from the tar sands is not given to us. But that the sun and the wind blow freely every single day. Perhaps they are given to us. And perhaps if we had heeded this teaching, we would not today have to be afraid of our own atmosphere. So underlying the practice of the honorable harvest are two basic ethical tenets. 
which I think are key to the cultural transformation that we need before we can walk together on that green path. And first is the notion that all beings with whom we share this planet are persons, non-human persons, with their own way of being, their own intentions, their contributions to the world, and their own rights to live. How different our world would be if we extended the same respect and compassion and agency to other species as we do to human people. We tolerate governance which grants legal personhood and free speech to corporations, but denies that respect to voiceless salamanders and sugar maples. Recognition for being, of personhood for all beings, opens the door to ecological justice. And our laws today are all about the governing about our rights to land. And the shift that I think we need is to have governance for the rights of the land. The rights of the land to be whole and healthy. The right to exist. And that may seem like pie in the sky. But we can follow the lead of indigenous nations all around the world. The Maori, who just several years ago declared in, in concert with the Crown, the Wanganui River of their homelands is a person with all the rights of a human being. We know that the Ecuadorian constitution enshrines the rights of Mother Nature and that our relatives in Bolivia have brought to the United Nations the Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. I think Mother Earth deserves a vote. Mm -hmm. The second precept to, f to close up, of the second precept of the Honorable Harvest, the one that I think we most need to reclaim, to carry in our bundles down that green path to the future, is the teaching of reciprocity that we are not just consumers, but we are givers as well. And we have told ourselves the story. In fact, we have lived the story that humans and nature are a bad mix. My ecology students, for example, my general ecology students, when I ask them, how much do you know? What is your fluency about negative relationships between people and the earth? They could fill pages. They, they knew that stuff. And I turned the question around and said, tell me, what do you know about the mutually beneficial relationships between people and the earth? And it was a very short list. How are we to move away from this exploitative worldview, from our view of ourselves solely as consumers, if we can't even conceive of a mutualism with the earth? And indigenous knowledge is rich in such teachings and protocols, ethical prescriptions for living them. This is where our efforts at de-extinction can go, to the regeneration of the ethics of reciprocity. And to heal our relationship with the land, we have to reclaim our role as givers. And our people say that gifts and responsibilities are two sides of the same coin. Just like birds were given the gift of song, they're also given the responsibility to greet the day. Stars were given the gift of sparkle and they were given the responsibility to guide us at night. What are our gifts as human people? We can't fly, we can't breathe underwater, and we can't even photosynthesize. <laughs> but we do have the gift of choice. We have the gift of story we have the gift of gratitude, of love, of hands that make ingenious tools and transformative art. We can put our hands into the earth, restoring the damage that we have done, healing the land just the way the plants have shown us to do it. We'll remember that it's not the land that's broken, but our relationship. And we can heal that relationship, all of us together. And it starts by asking ourselves, what will I give in return for the gifts of the earth? In return for the gift of birds and berries? In return for the privilege of breath? Meet you, miigwech. <laughs>